So right now, I happen to be outside of the town of Wiestrom, and this right here is Sword Beach. And from, from an American perspective, uh, you know, most Americans don't know as much about the British and Canadian landing beaches. Uh, one of the, the big things with Sword is it is essentially going to be the access point to get to the city of Caen, which is vitally important to both the Allies and to the Germans. Because guarding Caen was so important, one thing that you're going to see behind Sword Beach that you really don't see at any other beaches is a defense in depth with lots of different fortifications. And that is what we're going to be looking at today. All right, now I mentioned that most Americans uh, have a limited knowledge about what happened on the British landing beaches. I kind of count myself uh, among that group, which is why it's helpful to have a, a British guy with you. This is Paul Woodage. Uh, he has an outstanding YouTube channel called World War II TV and uh, has, has been a guide here in Normandy for, what, 20 years? 20 years, 20 yeah. years? Okay, so anyway, uh, he's gonna kind of walk us through some of the things here at Sword Beach. So a couple of things about Sword Beach. One is it tends to be grouped in with the taking or the failure to take Caen on D-Day, which is another story for another day. The fact is the uh, Sword Beach as a landing was incredibly successful. The cooperation between infantry and armor was really superb here. Beach masters did their job, the Navy mostly did their job. And despite some losses in the first waves, because it is the most fortified beach, in terms of the number of concrete installations behind it and the number of Germans defending it, there is no beach on D-Day that has more Germans behind it than Sword. But despite that number of Germans, the landings, as I said, work really well and they're able to push in land with Sherman tanks, the Funnies, Hobart's Funnies, Churchill tanks, with all the devices fixed to them to make bridging and doing all the sorts of uh, work on the beaches, all that worked perfectly. Now in my case, my great uncle Cyril, Cyril Rand, was a platoon commander in 2nd Battalion, the Royal Ulster Rifles, one of the reserve units on D-Day. He landed about half a mile that way behind me towards the late part of the morning on D-Day and fought throughout Normandy, wounded uh, in August, but he fought in the Battle of Combon Plain, uh, about five miles, six miles inland from Saw Beach over the next few days and weeks, and one of those guys that um, was here on the day and fought through for another um, two months. And he, as a, as a proud British soldier who was here, always felt that the, the lack of attention Sword Beach got or has received is something that should be addressed because it really was an example of, of, of brilliant effective military tactics and, uh, and, and um, coordination that day. Right, now here is one of the German bunkers that Paul was referring to. Now we're right here on the beach. So this one is covering the Queen Red section of the beach. There would have been a 75 millimeter gun in here. And if we move uh, around right here, you can see, well, of course, as we've seen with other bunkers, there's this wing that sticks out that is protecting this gun right here. So this is designed to flank the beach and uh, this particular bunker uh, has a, a little bit of a, a modern upgrade kind of interesting we are on Sword Beach. Uh, we're towards the right-hand flank of Sword Beach. Wiesterham, the ferry port, is about a mile that way. And you can see the curve of Sword Beach running off about another mile and a half that direction to the, uh, to the west there. And beyond the landings on Sword Beach themselves, one well, of the big hurdles in this area was the fact that between here and Caen, which is about nine miles uh, inland from us, are a series of additional fortifications, including um, the Hillman gun battery. Now, the the gun positions in this area were codenamed after manufacturers of British cars, so there's Daimler, Morris, Hillman. I learned to drive in a Hillman Imp, and Hillman is a few miles ahead of us, and it's essentially a 
the control area for a whole set of German defences in the area and it's fair to say the Allies in their intelligence work prior to D-Day had misjudged just how important it was to the Germans and they'd misidentified just how extensive the fortifications are that were there and we're going to be going to Hillman later on to tell you all about it but while we're here we want to reference some of the units that found themselves involved in the action around Hillman notably 1st Battalion of the Suffolk Regiment, who will be talking about there, but also the Norfolk Regiment, 1st Battalion of the Norfolk Regiment, who are on the monument here, who have the Britannia as their insignia. And the Norfolk Regiment uh, are not first wave on the beaches, they are a bit later on, so their day here getting off the beach wasn't too bad. Um, unlike the East Yorks and the South Lancs, who are the first wave along Sword Beach, who did suffer some pretty horrendous casualties in the first few moments, Norfolk's and indeed the Suffolk's less problems on the beach the problems they were going to encounter were all going to be inland as they get to a slight ridge of land where these additional defenses are such as hillman which we're going to take you to very shortly Right, we've just moved south off of Sword Beach and uh, we're in the, the town of Colville, Montgomery. Uh, this is where some of the British commando units would have moved through. Uh, also, uh, some of the, the regiments that were attached to the British 3rd Infantry Division. And uh, it, it, this area is now known for World War II history, but the history of this place goes a lot deeper. Uh, something pretty cool here that, that Paul pointed out to me. All right, now, again, speaking as an American here, we really don't have a concept of what old is in our country. Uh, this is a building here in Colville, Montgomery. And if you look a little closer at this particular building, it might be kind of hard to see, but you can see some etchings in this stone. And these are all carvings of Viking ships. So this is carvings that were made maybe five or 600 years ago, possibly, of the people of this area honoring kind of their, their Viking past. So there are all kinds of ships and longboats and things like that. So we've been kind of looking at this wall and uh, trying to find, you know, different carvings. Here's one up here that has an old name etched into it looks like Alexander something uh, the American guy is seeing Alexander pie but there's something after that so uh, anyway pretty interesting to see uh, just really the the depth of history here in this area We often talk about the landings in terms of axis routes off the beaches, uh, the causeways off Utah Beach, the, uh, the, the valleys, the draws off Omaha Beach. Off Sword Beach it's about these roads that run perpendicular to the beach towards the objectives and Caen is, is ahead of me there. And this is one of the arterial roads that comes off Sword Beach and up this road on June the 6th come elements of number 3 commando, number 6 commando. Suffolk Regiment, Norfolk Regiment all pushing towards Caen but before they get to Caen they've got to get past the 45 position at Hillman but the reason we're stopping here is it's up this way we have photographic evidence of commandos coming right past here you can see the church in the photo you can see the doorways on the side of the road there and you see commandos coming right past where we're standing all right so we just drove up to the position where Hillman Battery is located and just to kind of set up what's going on here. So Sword Beach is directly behind me in this direction and if you look off in the horizon uh, it may be kind of hard to see you know from this angle but there's some high ground there where the British Airborne were landing. Pegasus Bridge is going to be right over in this direction right here and on the morning of June 6th you would have had elements of the British commandos who would have been passing well within machine gun range of the Germans here that passed right by this position on their way to Pegasus Bridge because the objective is to get across the river and to get to the high ground. And the Germans who were here at Hillman let them pass 
because they knew that there was a larger force that was probably going to be following up and those guys are going to run right into this position here at Hellman. All right, so we've moved into the interior of the Hillman battery. And one thing that really stands out to me as being different from any of the other German batteries or bunkers that I've seen is a lot of this is at ground level or kind of submerged. So we see, you know, a, a Tobruk right over here. We've seen those before. And then there's a little cupola in the distance there, or if you're British, a cupola. Um, now, the Allies knew that Hillman battery was here, but they didn't realize the importance of it. Uh, to the Germans, this was going to be a key position that they were going to uh, vigorously defend. Okay, can't come to a German bunker and not do a little bit of exploring and looking around. Okay, so obviously we see you know, a spot there uh, that we've seen before where they would have had uh, maybe a machine gun set up to guard the entryway here. And then if we go up here into this to Brook, oh, careful not to bump my head. Oh. Now this is actually quite cool. So these are range markers here in this Tobruk that the Germans would have put. That is really interesting. Okay, so St. Albin sur Mer, that's Juno Beach. Um, what does that say? Lushtern 75 or 47, 50 meters. Uh, Kircha, that's German for church. And then Wistrom, Colleville. Very, very interesting. So you can see where they would have had everything ranged from right here in this position. Okay, moving now into the next spot in this bunker. And there's some pretty interesting stuff here. And uh, I, I wish that I could say that I already knew it and make myself sound really smart, but this is stuff that Paul just told me. Uh, so there would have been a shower right here for if there was a gas attack, you could, you know, wash all of the stuff off of you. And then this is something that's really kind of unique here at Hillman. In a lot of bunkers, they've removed these steel doors, but this door remains. So if you were a German soldier, well, there would have been a telephone right here that you could have called in and identified yourself. And then this steel door is over an inch thick. Okay, so this is a beast of a door. And notice that it opens outwards. Uh, so the design there is for a purpose uh, so that, you know, if you have uh, enemy soldiers who come in and try and blow the door open, well, it can't blow in. It's going to basically uh, be more uh, resilient, I guess you could say, to explosives. Also, you may ask, why is it kind of like a stable door? Why are there two halves here? Well, the reason is if this bunker gets bombed and rubble falls from the ceiling and blocks the bottom of the door here, well, the Germans could open the top part and still escape. So, so this, is, I mean, it, it looks pretty simple, but it really kind of points to uh, some of the, the German engineering that went into these bunkers. Pretty fascinating. Okay, kind of just moving along in this bunker here. Uh, if you look at this spot right here, you see uh, this chunk that has been blown out of, of this door. Now this isn't battle damage. Uh, Paul's telling me that back in here, there was a German generator, highly efficient, was a really good piece of machinery, and the British wanted it, so they rigged up explosives here to blow this out because the wall had been built around the generator and, and blew this chunk out so they could get the generator removed. And then here's an old German, uh, it's kind of dark in there now, uh, an old German water container. But I don't know, it's kind of neat. Every, every little nick and every little uh, mark on, on these bunkers uh, tells a little bit of a story. 
Uh, all right, we're gonna go ahead and, and go back to the surface now and uh, have Paul give us a little bit of rundown, a rundown as to, to what happened here on June 6th. Hillman is one of the sites that when people come here, they say, why the hell didn't the Allies bomb this and target this? Well, they did. It was bombed on D-Day. It was supposed to be hit by the Navy on D-Day. Uh, the Navy's off there on Sorbet. One of the problems is that a lot of the forward observers have either been killed or their, their radios aren't functioning. If we had bombed it and hit it, we're not going to do any damage. There's an uh, exit escape hatch here that goes down 25 feet, the lower level. So even if we bomb this, we're not going to do any damage anyway. This is a concrete replacement for a steel cupola turret that was here that goes down, periscopes, machine guns, the whole lot inside there. You can see all around us, there's ventilation shafts going down. This is a highly sophisticated, very well defended position and bombing it wouldn't have made much difference. What happened is the landings on Saw Beach essentially worked pretty well. Not many casualties coming ashore. They move inland and as the first troops of the 3rd Division got to Colville, the village down there, where the water tower is behind me was another German position, a code named Morris. Four guns inside casemates when they got there. It had been hit by the bombing and the German crews have kind of run away, abandoned it. There was no real fighting for Morris. Few, a, a sigh of relief uh, by the British here. But when they approach uh, from the village down there, there's more houses there now than there would have been then. The first kind of patrols come up the main road towards Hillman and they are unaware yet just exactly how extensive the defences are. There's a machine gun emplacement behind me near the telegraph pole there, barbed wire around this, minefields all in the fields behind me. The first patrol gets shot up uh, and they realise there's more here than they are anticipating. One of the, and it's a series of stages. One of the next stages is a tank, probably of the 13th, 18th Hussars that landed on Sword Beach, is sent up the, the, the lane that approaches um, Hillman. It gets to a certain point, the Germans have an anti-tank gun beside the road there, bang, the Sherman tank gets knocked out. I think the crew get out, but the tank blocks the lane for any more approach from that direction. Damn, that's a limiting the chance there. Now, you've got to remember that in June 1944, we're talking about three foot of, of, of crops in the field behind me there. And aware now that there's more here than anticipated, a first group of British soldiers and engineers start from the village down there. You can still see some corn down there today. They start examining what's ahead of them and they realize there's a very extensive minefield. So, they begin crawling using mine detectors in front of them they start clearing a path up through the minefield so they can think about attacking Hillman. Unfortunately at some point halfway up the slope someone in the village behind we're not sure exactly what happened but gets nervous or something and he pops a smoke grenade from the front of his rifle the land somewhere here and the Germans realize the smoke is covering something and probably that machine gun position there and maybe these ones here open up on that squad of British soldiers approaching. Now luckily they were in a slight kind of depression in the ground and although a couple wounded they weren't they weren't killed but they have to fall back. Now they are the British are firmly aware that the Germans now know we're coming. So the next consideration is rather than taking time to take Hillman can we not just bypass it why don't we just go past the left or go past the right commandos had already gone past the left to Pegasus Bridge unfortunately when they go around the left they come under fire from Hillman from that direction when they go around the right they come under fire over there and they also encounter some German armored units that are coming this way later on so that doesn't happen the next thing that happens is that Major General Rennie, the commander of the 3rd Division, realised there's a lot here, wants to use a more concerted force of allied armour, so Sherman tanks and maybe some funnies to use armour to penetrate through these defences here. And he starts getting a force assembled over there somewhere. It takes some time because they're still coming off sword beats, they're still sorting themselves out, de-waterproofing, there's still reconnaissance being done, etc, etc. And what happens is, is just as a it, the early afternoon these tanks are ready to kind of start pushing up here there's an urgent radio call comes in saying some German armor has been spotted up towards Juno Beach pushing towards the defenses there and unfortunately for what's happening here the decision was made that these tanks must go away and protect what had already been achieved gains already made rather than risking them for more gains more progression here so the tanks have to go which leaves now the fact that 
with no tank support, we've still got to clear Hillman, we've still got to get beyond here towards Caen. So there is this partially cleared path that the engineers uh, had done earlier, and using that, and I think they rope in a couple of tanks, they do plan a proper assault here from that position down there in the village sometime on the afternoon of June the 6th. And this is the Suffolk Regiment, uh, mostly D Company guys. Now you can imagine that coming up this slope towards us would have been for these guys, they'd have been feeling exactly the same trepidation their fathers metaphorically been feeling in the Battle of the Somme and places like that a generation earlier because you're basically fixing your pig sticker bayonet and you're walking up toward a slope towards a heavily fortified position, minefields and barbed wire, but it has to be done. There's no other choice. You can't bring up air power because there isn't any air power that can do anything so close to our own allied lines. It wouldn't be accurate enough. So they start coming their way towards us. There is some mortar support. There is some artillery support. The Germans, thankfully, have already expended quite a lot of ammunition here, dealing with the threat to the left and the right and the earlier attack. So they're kind of conserving their ammunition. And as they move their way up here, the British sense there's kind of a moment when although they're losing some men killed or wounded, moving fast now will overwhelm this. And the particular hero here is a five foot two Bren gunner in the company called Titch Hunter. Titch was a nickname for short. And with a Bren gun from down there somewhere, he just basically goes to hell lads and he runs up there, uses his Bren gun, knock, probably knocks out that first position down there, comes up here spraying 303, brrr, changing magazines, his, his assistant gunner running up behind him. He's the one who kind of manages to attack this one here. They drop grenades down some of the ventilation shafts. Now, the ventilation shafts have a, a grenade proof. They would only go and be trapped inside a, like a container. But this one here was an escape hatch. Uh, it goes straight down. So if you can get a grenade down there, it's actually going to detonate inside. And they probably do that and they move up, more infantry come up, others coming up the lane past the knocked out tank and after a really fraught battle and it's hand to hand stuff, clearing bunker by bunker by position by position, the bayonet's fixed by kind of close of play on June the 6th, maybe 7 p.m., 8 p.m., they have finally seized Hillman. But when they realize the darkness is not far away now and they've, they're, they're licking their wounds, they're, they're patching up their wounded and casualties, they realise the ultimate goal of Caen, which is still several miles ahead, is they're not going to reach it that day. And although it's a story for another day, when they mount their push for Caen in the next few days, what's happened is more of these same tanks I mentioned earlier, German tanks and 21st Panzer Division have arrived and the whole battle for Caen descends into a month-long campaign of, of the British you know, claw, clawing and crawling their way towards Caen. But when you stand here and you realise how close Caen is, you realise the potential of getting to Caen was, was really within the British grasp. If only they had fully realised how extensive this position is and maybe coordinated themselves a little bit quicker. I'm not criticising anybody here, but each each stage of this took time. The loss of the first tank, the loss of the, uh, the, the men in the minefield there, and uh, as the time is ticking, you're losing that initiative, you're losing that ability to push on and get to your objective. But Hillman, and I'm saying this as a Brit to a predominantly American audience, is one of those sites that people need to come and see and read about and understand about because it is one of the thorns in the side that really prevented the British progression from sword getting as far as Caen on June the 6th. Here's another one of the concrete bunkers here at Hillman. Got a little rain going on right now, so I don't know how much longer we'll be able to hang out here. But here at this bunker, you can actually see some evidence where the tanks shot it up a little bit. So here's a, a big chunk that was taken out here. And then back over here, 
you can see another spot where a tank round hit. And then there is a, a monument or a plaque to the 1st Battalion of the Suffolk Regiment. We have moved uh, about a mile south of the Hillman Battery. Got a little bit of a rain situation going on right now. And there in the distance you can see the city of Calm. So we were very, very close to uh, to getting to the targeted objective on D-Day. And right here is a, a really nice monument to the Royal Norfolk Regiment. It says, in memory of our 116 comrades who fell on D-Day, 6th of June to the 9th of July, 1944. So really what you're looking at is a representative of about a quarter of that regiment that was lost in the advance to Con. All right, well, that was just a little bit on Hillman Battery, one of the, the many batteries and strong points and radar stations that the British had to contend with on D-Day and in the days after in their advance to Con. Now, the British have received uh, a fair amount of criticism for not reaching the objective on D-Day, but whenever you're actually out here on the ground and you see what these guys had to contend with, well, makes it a little bit more understandable, makes a little bit more sense. Uh, these aren't places that they could just completely bypass and leave behind them because that would have posed an even greater danger. But anyway, learned a lot here today. Uh, but for now, we're going to get in out of the wind and rain and head on to the next place.